here because it's time. Okay, good. You guys can hear me. <laughs> Yay. All right. So I'm definitely going to be doing um, all kinds of um, question answering at the end. Um, I'm going to talk about just tips for new art teachers. So if you're somebody in like your first five years, like, so for me, um, I remember being in my third, no, I was in my, I don't know, third, fifth, whatever, whatever year it was. And I remember um, we had a district coach and she was like, yeah, I didn't really, you know, you're not really in the groove until at least year five. That's when I really felt like I had a group. And that's so true. When you're a teacher, um, it, it was when I hit that mark, I'm like, yeah, I do feel like I have kind of like my own groove going on, but there's just so much to learn with that job. It's like insane, insane. So I'm going to take all the tips that I have learned over the years and I'm going to share them with you. Um, and then you can choose to agree with me, disagree with me, um, and then take whatever you want, pick and choose, and then see if it's um, something that maybe is going to be applicable for you. Um, going into this new year and that's the whole idea um the world is a different place <laughs> right we i've been i've asked been asking teachers like what is your biggest struggle you're facing and like number one is that the students since covid have their patience level everything is a little bit different and i think maybe just teachers too i think that there was a lot of um not not a lot of community like respect during that time i think we're just like needing a little bit i think you just need a lot more like deserving respect high fives and love and recognition for all that magic that has happened and is still continuing to happen i i've been hearing everybody say like last year was the hardest year <laughs> and if you're a new teacher um yeah, you're navigating a whole different world. When I started teaching, when I was a new teacher, like 13 years ago at this point, um, it was a totally different ball game. It, I mean, we didn't even have social media. Now you guys are navigating kids with TikTok. I cannot even imagine <laughs> what that's like. Um, I mean, I did. I mean, I have had that, you know, you, you got kids in elementary school with doing TikTok moves. The whole WAP one was not great to see um, from elementary kids. <laughs> but anyways, we got to go on and start. I was just kind of giving some people some time to join us here. It looks like we got a good crew. Um, and so we're going to begin, my friends. Here we go. So I'm going to be talking about my top five tips, advice, um, for new art teachers, if you're a first year art teacher, you're year two, three, four, five, whatever, or if you're just looking for some solid, solid advice going into this school year, that is why you're here. I'm going to give you what I got and just navigating that. Okay. So now before I do like a deep dive in on this, just know again that in your first years, you're going to learn a lot, a significant amount. Whatever they taught at school is nothing compared to what you experience and learn from experience as a teacher. And you might every single year do things a little bit differently. Um, I always did things a little bit differently all the way through, right? But you're gonna do things a lot differently everything every single year, right? Because you're gonna you're gonna figure out your kids and you. Um, you're gonna discover you. You're gonna take things that you learn from university or education and then tweak them to make it work for your teaching style. Um, and everybody's teaching style is a little bit different and everybody's students are very different. So you gotta, over the years, think about what's gonna work best for your kids, but also for you. Um, so just know that, yep, mistakes are going to be made I always made mistakes, but my friend, that is what you learn from, right? And that's okay. You learn from your mistakes. Not only in my studio as an artist do I make mistakes. Um, I love telling the story of how I made an artwork, delivered it to a show. Um, the gallery is ceramics. The gallery did not secure it to the wall in the correct manner. It fell off the wall onto a cement floor. It smashed. It was huge. <laughs> smashed in a gallery show in downtown Vancouver smashed um right after opening like the day after opening smashed <laughs> and then um they're like they call me 
And I'm like, okay, forgiveness. And then I'm going to come and drive all the way back downtown, bring you another artwork. And then somebody knocked it off the plinth. And then it smashed. <laughs> so, um, yeah, um, uh, we, we decided mistakes were on both parts, maybe. I don't think so. But anyways, and we learn from these things. And let me tell you, I do not, ha I, I am the one who hangs my artwork if I hang it. And I've learned so much from that. <laughs> and just everything there's a lot and just even the you know everything from there you can learn and teaching I learned I made a lot of mistakes I, I recognize them even during lessons I would make mistakes I would acknowledge it and model how I how I fix mistakes to kids right like if I'm drawing with straight up oil pastel the first time I make a mistake that's an opportunity to learn that I'm not gonna rip up my pencil break it what or rip up my paper break my pencil or whatever I'm going to use this as an opportunity to show that I'm going to stay calm to the kids. I'm like, guys, I made a mistake, but this is an opportunity to learn, right? We learn from our mistakes and I show how I problem solve and fix it during lesson. And just those little things that we can do over time are like little incremental steps that lead to massive growth, right? Just modeling growth mindset um, all the time in your classroom, total gold, right? Because then the kids can see what they should do when they make a mistake. But you're going to make mistakes as a teacher just in th lots of, in every sort of way and know that it's okay, right? So be patient with yourself. Be positive. You're going to learn new skills, whether it's engagement strategies, participation techniques, classroom management, and teaching strategies. And no matter how much you have learned, again, in your student-teacher classroom, um, in your first year, and any part of your journey, um, if it was a teaching program that we were part of, um, I know that we all have different paths that to becoming art teachers, depending on where we live. So you might have um, different levels of experience with that as well. Um, but you're going to, you're about to learn more. Okay, I'm going to give you more to expand on that. Some things that not, are all, not always are said, right? Um, and all your emotions you're about to feel going into this year are totally valid and typical and we all went through it okay we all go through those emotional roller coasters we all enter our first years like yes i got this i'm planned i know what i'm gonna do and we go through the first few months and then it hits where you're like just completely mind blown lost stressed out all the emotions all the above and then you have this like huge <sighs> low <laughs> where you're just at a loss, and this is when you're going to re reference some of this advice in this webinar, and then you're going to have a high where you're like, okay, I made it through, it's okay. And it could be this year, it could be when in, in one of your more challenging years, um, but at some point that you're going to feel that. And I remember, like, I used to work at a, an extraordinarily challenging school, and it was um, first of, at, because that was all I could get a job at, but then I, I stayed beyond, I could have left and years I stayed there. Um, I could have left, chose not to. I stayed there because I, I knew I was making a massive difference for the kids. Um, but boy, every time you would see a new person at that school, no matter how many years, because it was the hardest school in the district, um, just a strong concentration of different challenges, all kinds of challenges, everything, everything. Every year I was like, I never thought I would see this happening. And it was, <laughs> it was crazy. It was just one of those places, but, um, yeah, like you would see a new person come in and you're like, you know, oh, they're gonna, they're all confident and it's back to school, but they don't know what's coming. <laughs> and you did, new first year. It doesn't matter how many years that they'd be teaching at that school, it was like, you're going back into your first year. <laughs> it's one of those, and you go up, you're like, yes, I got this. And pfft, you would just see them like, you'd be going past their classroom and they're like slumped, <laughs> slumped. You know that teacher exhaustion slump? You just, or like the one where they're just like, stare, you're walking past and people are just staring into like the, the space somewhere on the ceiling. That look, you can just tell that's the slump. You know you're there because you have nothing left. But, I'm, but it goes up from after that. So if you're like, I don't know if I'm ever, if you get to that spot, just know that there is a place beyond it. So a little bit about me. I'm here for you. I'm going to give you my advice so you, you can navigate it 
life, right, as a teacher. So about me, I got my Bachelor of Education with a minor in secondary teaching. After my Bachelor of Visual Art, I graduated and went through a teacher, um, teacher program at the University, um, Simon Fraser University in Vancouver. Um, I live in Canada. So I went through another, got my second degree in education. And after I went through the teaching program, because they build you up to think that you are amazing, right? I thought, yes, I can do this. I'm so energized. It went so smooth, right? But I didn't realize that I had entered a classroom when I did my practicum and they were already fully trained <laughs> and they were high school kids. It was a lot different. So anyways, I got hired. Um, and eventually after a couple of years, I transitioned to elementary and I told myself in university, I was like, I'm never going to teach in elementary. And that's literally where I, where I was. I was mostly there of all the years. I started in high school for a few years and transitioned all the way down. I went through all the grades, but um, I loved it. So uh, subse subsequently, I was also crushed and realized that year after year, there was so much to learn. And this is where I went to that school that was very challenging. Um, I thought I finally felt like I had a grasp on things at like year five. But again, there was so much to learn. And to be honest, I kept learning and figuring, figuring things out all the way through year 10 and beyond. So there was always something to learn or a curveball thrown at you. Even though I thought I had seen it all, let me tell you, when I thought I, I've seen it all, that's when <laughs> those curveballs hit you from the side, smack in the face, so like you're playing dodgeball with kids and you just magically get whacked in the face. You're like, okay, I'm going to pretend that just didn't knock my glasses across the gym. Gross. I hate that. I think you go put them back on your face. Ooh. <laughs> so don't worry we all went through it and you'll love it so teaching's a journey kids are humans and although the year seems like it is in the same pattern not ever will you have two teaching years that are like there's no way you might be teaching the same you know you might have your year-long plan that you sometimes repeat or you do it every second year like a year a year b but let me tell you things are never going to be the same <laughs> And so we're going to dive in on the top five ed tips and advice for you. So first, like know your why. So when you're teaching, I think we need to stop and reflect more often than not on our purpose and why, especially when it gets to those hard times, reminding yourself of why you're there is essential. <laughs> and we should do this, in fact, for everything we do. Like, why are we doing what we are doing. Are we just going through routine and habits or rituals or is there an actual purpose? And when we are teaching, we are affecting kids' lives, right? So it helps to approach your day with your why. You can even have it like tucked in your day, your teacher binder, like with your day plans and maybe have it somewhere where you can see it. Even if it's small, you can glue it in there, whatever. Um, and then have it visible for you as a reminder for those tough times when they hit, when you hit that slump, Remember your why. You just got to get through that hard time because it always ascends after that. You will always get out and you'll be a different person and you'll be so much stronger. Know that you will gain strength from that. You will, you will definitely gain a teacher strength, a little hardened part of yourself that can take a lot more. Let me tell you. Um, yeah, you go from soft to not <laughs> in a different way, right? You can just take it um, differently whatever that is that is happening. Um, so yeah, just know your why, um, for why you teach and your purpose for being there. Like, why did you choose to be there and show up for kids every day? Not only is it important for you to clarify for yourself, but it will be better for your students too because you're gonna be actively working towards your why and your purpose, which will make it a better experience for your students, but also for you. So in my opinion, knowing why you teach is part of teaching art to kids. Like, why are you going to show up and do this every day? Why did you become an art teacher? And I guarantee that when you go through an art teacher job interview that you're going to be asked this in one way or another. So thinking about this and answering this is important on many levels. And recently I was asked this in an uh, interview with NBCLX. 
Um, I was asked to think about some of these questions prior to the interview and, and it was a, a, like a video interview. Like I was doing a part of a segment kind of thing, but you know, they like edited it down to like 30 seconds at the most, <laughs> but they asked me this prior to the interview. And honestly, this shook me up the most because I hadn't thought about it in a while. And it's not that I haven't been asked this before. I, it's just that I was just startled and realizing that I was struggling, struggling to pinpoint my new why. Right? My life had, has recently gone through some changes and I was struggling to readjust thinking about my new why. And I had lots of reasons um, for why I do what I do. But again, they changed. And after being um, in a classroom more than a decade, I have no longer in the classroom every single day. And I'm refocusing my life on being miseratastic creating curricular content. I realized that I was extraordinarily burnt out from doing two full-time jobs and having no weekends or evenings, like no holidays. It was too much. I was running for over 12, 13 years at an extraordinary pace and I finally hit my breaking point. So I've gone through some adjustments very recently that last year, it's been a whole new adjustment. So when I was asked my why and the journalist had, I realized had already researched me across all of my websites, including my like actual art, which is in that side of the space in my studio. It's my, that's like Kathleen McGivern, not, this is like, this is fantastic. <laughs> so like they had gone through my, uh, my own art, which is very personal. Right. And I knew that I realized that they had, they knew my shifts also. They had looked at me through all the social media and stuff like that. And I'm like, dang, you really do research. Jeez. Um, so I was a little bit startled and I felt terrified because after leaving teaching, I really replaced those hours where I told myself, like, you need to have a personal life, not working. And I just couldn't handle not running at that, that speed. And I just replaced those hours with more misartastic hours so, <laughs> and forgot to slow down at all and reflect on my why, my purpose. And so night after night, being terrified and awake, thinking about this interview that's about to happen and my why, <laughs> I have rewritten my why for what is me now, all right? And this has evolved and obviously as I have evolved, I have a different why as a classroom teacher and I had a different why at the time of getting my Bachelor of Visual Art, a different why when I went into Bachelor of Education and now I have this shift, right? So it's an ever evolving process as you go through your own journey, your own transformation and even at the time of writing this. So this is my why and it's not gonna be yours, but um, definitely pick something for you. And I'm gonna share this, be vulnerable with you, and um, you can think about it for what you're doing. And I hope this kind of helps because, or maybe you see part of yourself in this too, and you can use it as something that speaks to um, and inspires you. And then maybe after you listen to this, you can write, find a piece of paper, whatever, Google Doc on your phone, something, type in my why and just spend some time like put a timer on reflect for 15 minutes think about your why and then just type whatever comes to your mind and don't judge it and then you can edit it later but just think about your why okay so here's my why so for a few reasons i teach art and first i love art and ever since i can remember i have always love art. So it's my passion that I want to share with others to inspire them and to help them along their own artistic journey. And I think that creative thinking, critical thinking, and exploring our own identity and individualism is essential for the paths that we each take. And it's necessary, it's a necessary skill for all career choices and to continue to progress in general as humans. And second, I believe that we are all artists or that we're all creative thinkers and then just express it in different ways. And I'm a creative type and I know how it feels to grow up as a kid who loved to make art. And I know how it feels to like always have this natural instinct to want to create and constantly have ideas percolating in my imagination. As well, I know how impactful it is when you're growing up as a creative and you have a mentor or a teacher that sees you in this as well, right? I think I think back to a few teachers that stood out and recognized that creativity in me. When I was a student, there's a time in grade six and grade four, and then in high school, grades nine to 12, I had the same person. 
but they recognize that creativity and let me express it in all kinds of ways. And they let me express my own ideas and individuality. And I had a teacher that even let me explore the depths of my imagination that helped me along this journey to where I am today. And finally, I want to encourage kids to create and make art. And I know I can help them take those initial steps and teach them how to create artworks that are focused around their interests. And I think that's super big. When people are wondering, like, how am I going to engage kids? Yes, there's absolutely the curriculum. There's art history and artists. There's elements and principles. So can we also take those and maybe create or design lessons that merge those things also with their interests and we speak to them. And when people are seeing themselves in something, they want to engage with it more, right? If you could take the current trend somehow, that's appropriate, and merge it with an element of art, space or whatever, line, value, can't they are going to want to engage with it more in a different way. What instead of you asking them perhaps to design a mug. They're not maybe they're not even drinking coffee yet and they don't like hot chocolate. And it's the mug is irrelevant to their life. But if it's something to do with like a cool video game that they're playing right now or I don't know, whatever, whatever it is. Unicorn, you know, like the trends change, whatever. But you merge it with a value design of something else that's in their interest, it it brings them and focuses them in a different way, right? Uh, and they want to engage. And I can help kids understand how to use art mediums. I can help kids learn how to use those mediums in a variety of techniques, right? Multiple techniques and with a multiple range of mediums. I love blending them together because it's another way of engaging as well. When you're just doing one medium, they get bored after a while, but you bring in two, suddenly you start off with one and then just as they get bored or start going, ah, okay, it's no longer a shiny object, you spring in the second one and suddenly they're re-engaged again, right? It's brand new all over again, partway through the art project. Um, so, and I also like to help kids build their, their art making confidence. I'm, I feel like I had a really good grasp on doing that through growth mindset, practices and teaching growth mindsets and instilling that in back to school as part of my proactive classroom management strategy. Um, because I really believe in proactive classroom management strategies, right? That there's a classroom management is not a reactive process. It is a proactive process. The things you do to build routines, your systems, how you approach and connect with kids at the beginning of the year, community building, um, your social emotional learning and growth mindset that you instill at that beginning stage, those first two months is back to school, right? It's a bit, it's, back to school is not a week. It's like a two month pro process of instilling these things over time. So that way you have a well-oiled machine later. And that's the, hopefully the, the idea. And sometimes that well-oiled machine never comes. <laughs> Sometimes you cannot control what kids were put in a classroom together and or what things happen. Some things are out of your control, but you can control how you set up your year, right? You can control that and what you, you instill and try to make happen, okay? But you, there's some things that are completely not in your control and we unfortunately have to face them. Um, but that is it, right? So, so often as a, when I was a classroom teacher, um, I would see them looking at what they were about to create, right? Those examples. And you would just see it in their thoughts, in their expressions, like, no way can I make that. You could just see there's like kids already starting to check out. They're looking at that. They're like, no, I cannot do that, right? The, that growth mindset is not there yet. It hasn't been, it's not initiating, initiating yet. But I would teach in a growth mindset style, right? So then I would take them through it, you know, in my processes. And then upon completion, they would stand back and look at their artwork. And I would see that magical moment, that pure joy on their faces that read like, wow, I can't believe that I made that. And it's that sense of amazement, that wonderment, and that pure joy and excitement. That is why I teach. And it's rewarding. And therefore, I want to encourage that. So one way that I do continue teaching is not only by creating our education resources and lessons for teachers to use in their classroom as Ms. Artastic, um, so either through my Teachers Pay Teachers store or through the Artastic Collective Art Curriculum membership, but I also offer art lessons online for kids that they can stream directly to their home. 
that speaks to their interests. And I also do them for free um, drawing tutorials on my YouTube channel that I post two weekly, Miserastic. Everything's Miserastic. You just gotta search on anything, podcast, Google, <laughs> YouTube, Miserastic. I have, I'm, I'm everywhere. Um, I have no light. That's why I was running really low there for a while. <laughs> Cause I was also full-time teaching. <sighs> that was a dumb idea at the time. Um, in terms of taking on all that and then also teaching. Don't do it. It's my advice. Um, but to be honest, I'm sure that I never grew up. And I think that's a personal strength. Like you look around, everything's a little bit silly in here. And I think that's my strength for also connecting to kids. And I, okay, to be honest, I love Beanie Boos. I don't know why. At first, I was really not into beanie boos when they first came out because i was the um beanie baby kit you know kid right i grew up when beanie babies were the <laughs> rage okay so when they brought back brought it back and re re released them as beanie boos i was like that's not a beanie baby i was like not into it but i love them now i collect them okay Shh. <laughs> I also love Pokemon Go. Anybody else? Like, I'm so addicted. Okay. Anyways, I know how it feels to be a kid and an artist. And sometimes it is hard to access art lessons or resources. However, with technology, that has changed. So I chose to make them accessible at any time, anywhere. Using art mediums that kids can easily use to make art, but also add their own artist flavor. And I think that's something we all need to instill, is allowing kids to add their own artist flavor because you don't want to crush that creativity and eventually apply the techniques to their own artworks from their imaginations. So my friend, decide on your why. That was mine. I got vulnerable with you guys. That was it. That was, whew, that's my life. Um, but decide on your why as an art teacher. So like, think about it. what is your why? Part of your action item after this, or even right now, maybe you were thinking about it, write down your why. So Check it out. I want you to make sure that you print it off, have it written down somewhere and reference it every day, somewhere visible or like secret that you, maybe it's underneath your binder, on your table, whatever it's gonna be. Use it as your affirmation to keep you motivated, keep your energy high when it's really low and keep you on track for your purpose every day. Each of us has a different why, a different purpose and a different journey through education. So my next tip is to find a mentor. This was my game changer through my whole um, teaching career. Now, I did not do the, a mentor program. When I say you can, you can, you can definitely sign up. If your district or school, whatever, offers like a teacher mentor program, um, you can totally do that. Um, you can you can join a community online, but it's not really the same. But find somebody at your school that can even be like a different subject. They're not they don't need to be a specials. I know I think I think in the United States it's called specials. Like our teachers are specials, but it doesn't have to be another like it doesn't have to be the music teacher. It could be any other teacher in the building because you're gonna learn from them regardless, right? What they have learned and their experiences are often applicable to what you're doing. And I often found that just being learning and observing what other classroom teachers were doing at different levels, at different grades, I would often pick and choose, even from the kindergarten teacher, I would pull things that they were doing and make it applicable even for older grades, right? Because they have different ways of connecting and it just it's really good to see what other people are doing and then try it out and see if it works for you. But it's just a different way to get different perspectives of how things can be done. And so one of the best things that I did in my years, all my years as a teacher, was to latch on to more experienced teachers and glean information and teaching strategies and engagement techniques. That was I did that so often. Always, always, didn't matter, every single year. I loved observing how, because I needed to observe, I'm a visual learner, but I would observe how they wrote lesson plans, plan their own units, and how they kept organized. I loved going around and asking to look at how someone organizes their classroom, like before the bell. I would look at their lesson plan books and their day books just to get ideas, how they prepped for the week to get all kinds of information. That was a hugely, hugely um, resourceful thing. And if you've never been in a kindergarten classroom, my goodness, that is some organization there. 
because uh, <laughs> they have so much more things, right? That like, like an art classroom would have lots of stuff to organize, my goodness. So just seeing how people do those kinds of things, how they track assessment and how they perform assessment, all these can be observed um, with other teachers. You can ask them so many different things. Like I would just pop in and be like, yo, I love your class and it's so good, do you think? And then ask them questions, right? Can, you, can I see like, oh wow, look at that, you know, get them going and then open, get them to open up and then share a little bit about what they're doing. <clears throat> and I think that's hugely resourceful. It's a free resource. And it's so impactful, and I think you can take it and make it work for your classroom too. But teaching strategies are teaching strategies, so it's really, really great, right? So no matter, it doesn't matter if, again, the mentor that you find is in a different subject or grade. It's irrelevant, in my opinion. Even, you know what, it's probably better that they're not in your same subject in the grades that you teach. Because you can learn, again, from different perspectives. And what one person is using in language arts, um, maybe is a different, is a way that they're, you know, a strategy that you're using in language arts to increase comprehension, comprehension and understanding could be a strategy that you use in art history lessons, right? Like if they're using something that works really well as a strategy, again, to engage kids, to increase their comprehension in language arts, Maybe you can tweak it to make it work for your art history lesson if you're struggling to keep kids engaged through your own instruction, right? Maybe you can think, of, see what they're doing that works and maybe try apply it to you, right? Is it different content? Yeah, again, but teaching strategies are teaching strategies no matter what. And my advice is to ask the teacher if you can learn from them and observe their lessons. So ask your administrator if they're cool with this, but explain it because you want to professionally develop. And sometimes when you you explain your why of why you want this before I tell you what it is, they they might be a, they might be willing to do this because of the why, right? We always go back to the why. So maybe ask your administrator to cover one of your classes for like thirty minutes so you can observe or use your planning time. I've done that too, right? because the person, some other teachers are teaching while I have planning, right? Or prep time. Um, ask your administrator to cover one of your classes for 30 minutes or use your planning or prep time. So that way you can observe your mentor teacher delivering a lesson. They might say yes, they might say no, but I would think that there is more inclination to say yes, because it's gonna help you become better as a teacher and be like very specific about why you're wanting to do this. Or maybe use your prep block, right, for observation if it works out. Yeah, it sucks to also go in earlier that day, and, but you could always go in earlier and plan and get your planning or prepping done before school to make up that time, right? You can always, it's just one time, just to see how somebody else do, does it, right? Sometimes it's nice to have that refresher to see, observe, you know, observing someone else. It's been a while since maybe teacher school or your bachelor of ed, whatever it is, your teaching program, and it's nice to see somebody else instructing both as a refresher or just to glean again ideas of instructional methods um just watching them get the classroom attention and how they progress through a lesson how long it takes them to go from instruction to demonstrate you know doing a lesson demoing whatever the task is and then what their work time is what does work time in their classroom look like how are they doing that how are they circulating and helping kids how are they doing formative and formative and summative assessment while this all happens? How are they tracking data while this happens? You can learn a lot just from observing a lesson to any grade on any subject of, of a strong teacher, right? Find someone who's experienced and glean information. Okay, so again, your, your district, check and see if they have a mentor program. They might, and it's worth to ask, ask the school board or school to see if one is available. And finally, my last point for this part is when selecting a mentor teacher, find someone who has a similar teaching style to you. If you are like a little bit more fluid, I never had like seating plans in my classrooms ever. I'm a little bit more fluid. Um, I didn't mind chatting or whatever, but some people are like super rigid and they're very rigid in lots of different ways. And for me, it was not going to go well, right? So find someone you vibe with and then that would be your mentor. Um, is all right. Find someone who's similar with however your similar is. Um, but even if you can't find that, 
um, don't, no worries. If you can't find someone who's similar, no worries. Go with anybody who's experienced because you're still going to learn a lot, right? You never know what you're going to learn. You can't judge before you go and observe. Okay, next point is to value creativity and experimentation. So I like to place a lot of emphasis on valuing creativity and experimentation. And a lot of this is also going to be part of your classroom management, engaging kids in your classroom, right? If you're, white, if you're struggling with getting kids to engage in lessons or have lessons speak to their interests, this is one of them ways that you could do it, right? There's lots of different ways. This is part of it. So value creativity and experimentation. So my advice is to always focus your classroom on encouraging creativity and experimentation. Let your students have the option. I try to always do this, but let them have the option to add their own, as I like to call it, artist flavor to an artwork or to investigate their ideas through their choice-based learning, um, task cards and open-ended art projects or sketchbook prompts. Um, those kind of things are perfect as they're not comparing their art to the example every time, right? Even I would do a lot of lessons that um, I tried to go back and forth between allowing a student, full student choice and ones that were like, this is the example, we're going to create this. However, even though I did, this is the example, we're making this kind of art projects often, I'd always explain to the kids before we start that you feel free to add your own artist layer. If I'm drawing eyes one way and you really hate doing them that way, and, it's, and the lesson's not on creating realistic eyes or eyes in this specific style, if it doesn't change the meaning of the curricular content or targets, right, as long as they're still meeting that or the, the purpose or intention of the art project, then they can do the eyes or whatever in the style that they want to. It doesn't, it's irrelevant, right? What style it was drawn in. So let them go for it. If it fails, they've learned from that. Remember, remind them that they're going to experiment and it may work, may not work, but they're not getting any piece of paper. <laughs> um, but um, mistakes are okay. If they make a mistake, figure out how you can work with it, right? If it's not gonna make cause World War III, um, then they need to work with that piece of paper and work it into the artwork, right? Unless it is going to work cause World War III, that is not something to, it's better to give them a new piece of paper. Sorry, something's happening outside. That was a sketchy noise, to be honest. Anyway, so um, yeah, so let them investigate their ideas. Um, but really, there is nothing more soul crushing to kids um, than a teacher killing creativity or freedom to express, right? Don't kill creative freedom. So let them add their own artist flavor or something that reflects each individual's identity. Maybe do a mashup with the impressionist style and something from today, right? Or a modern cityscape and then, or take kids outdoors so they can create their own observational artwork, right? With oil pastels in the impressionist style after you teach it. So like if you're teaching impressionism, a lot of impressionists went out into the world to create their, their um, paintings and capture the way that life change, uh, sorry, that light changes through uh, over time, right? So take them outside and that way they're making their own artwork, but they're still have learned about impressionism. They're still applying the impressionist style or techniques from that the impressionists use, um, but they're making it own and they're adding their own artist flavor and they're learning about observational skills and they're learning to see how life changes over time or whatever it is, right? They're learning that they're still getting it and they still learn about impressionism, but they're still getting that creative freedom, right? Let them create their own art. And that is encouraging creativity and experimentation, but also again, teaching impressionism without making it dry and lifeless and turning your students into colored photocopiers, okay? So ways to encourage creativity and experimentation in your classroom. So these are a list of ideas. Um, is there more than beyond this? Absolutely, absolutely. Be creative. Creativity means that there is an end, there is endless ideas out there. You just gotta find them. That's it. That's the cool thing about creativity is there's no answers. There's no one answer. You can just make up the answer. When you think about it, that could be an answer. But here are some ideas. Incorporate choice-based learning opportunities into your year, okay? 
Another is to allow for more collaborative art opportunities. You can also allow for more open-ended or student-led artworks. You can value and encourage diverse perspectives. You can allow for more individuality and artist flavor, what I call it, to allow creativity to flourish. You can also allow for more small group instruction to draw out your students' strengths and support them. You can also allow for more one-to-one -one student teacher conferencing, right? So mid-project after you've set up the instruction, you've done your initial lesson where you, you know, teach its concept, teach a whatever it is, um, teach the instruction, teach a technique, um, then you have kids begin creating and then partway through the project, you have a conference, a quick one. It could be just you floating around doing 30 seconds or a minute at each table over a couple classes, maybe. And you're doing one-to-one -one, and you're just seeing where they're at, seeing what's asking them what's working, what's not working, and then giving some, them some advice for where to go or where to take it or how to make it their own and add their own flavor in it. Right? So that way they're not getting um, only judged at the end of the project, right? They're not only, it's not, it's too late, right? To make any changes once it's at the end for them, right? It's too late. So maybe you can do some more middle assessment, right? Do some more in progress assessment and then, you know, do your full assessment at the end, right? But that way they're giving them an opportunity um, and some advice during the messy middle. So that way they can flourish at the end. Um, focus on building a range of engagement strategies. So I would spend time think, finding out, researching a range of engagement strategies. That is super important and don't use the same ones all the time. Have a, have like a tool belt or a selection that you're going to use to keep them interested and engage them throughout your classes. Whether it's a quick draw to share their ideas, whether it's a think pair share um, where they think to themselves, so when you pose a question to them, allow them to do a think pair share instead of putting up your hand right away and getting only one hand, the same kid all the time, you can say, okay, we're going to do a think pair share. I want you to think first for a minute. Then we're going to share with just, you know, finger width away or shoulder to shoulder share with the buddy next to us, our ideas. So that way they get their ideas plus their buddy's ideas working together. And then more kids, then we're going to share out as a class afterwards. And then we're going to have a lot more to say, Right? Because now they've thought about it. They've had time to think about the answer. They've now got their friends' ideas also mixed in there. And they probably built on their own idea. And then they can share. And you're going to get a lot more kids putting up their hands wanting to share. Um, that works so well. So well. Uh, you could do feature ones. You could do um, KWLs. Uh, no wonder learns. You could do quick writes and have them do a quick write on something as uh, even an exit ticket um, to reference what they learned last class, right? Your, um, what's it called? Bell ringer. They could do a quick write or a quick draw to show what they learned last class and then get them to really think about that again. <clears throat> I definitely read the book Total Participation Techniques a lot. That was my favorite. And I used the the techniques in the book, Total Participation Techniques, K-12, to for over a decade. They were always relevant, no matter that, no matter how different education was over a decade ago, right? Which way it was significantly different than it is now, right? Um, those have always been relevant. They were simple, they were extraordinarily re reflective, and they really did do what it said. There was total participation, total engagement strategies, and uh, it encouraged student participation in lessons, and that's what it is. So if you're looking for that, a new book to add and you're wanting that one book that's going to change things, total participation techniques. I cannot remember who wrote it because I cannot find it right now. I have no idea where it is. Honestly, I think that when I'm, it's, it got jacked in my classroom at one point, um, but... Mm -hmm. But anyways, um, yeah, amazing book. Okay, so the next advice is to encourage active learning. So lessons can be delivered. I'm gonna try that again. <laughs> lessons can be delivered 
in a lot of ways. So my advice is to change it up always to keep them engaged, to try and teach all that your all your learners, right? So we want to keep them engaged and we want to teach all the different kinds of learners in our classroom, right? Not everyone's going to learn the same way. And our goal as educators is to teach as many of those different types of learners that we can through using all lots of different engagement strategies, right? To control participation techniques, but also encouraging active learning. We want to teach in a variety of different ways, again, to set access all our different types of learners. Um, so again, read that book, Total Participation Techniques. And I'm not getting any like affiliation or anything from the statement. Just like I'm honestly telling you that if there's one book that stuck to me and was effective from start to finish, that was one of them. And not for, because it was, it was not an art book, no, not anything. It was just about teaching strategies and getting kids to engage. And that is extremely important as a teacher. <laughs> so, so good. And I was a high school teacher when I started using that one. And I thought these are like elementary kind of techniques. They weren't. They worked, let me tell you. So if you're like, oh, that's not going to be relevant to me. I teach older kids. That's where I started, okay? <laughs> that was where I started. I've done it all. I've used it K to 12. I promise you it's good. It's relevant always. It, it might be, a, my. I bought it over again, probably 13 years ago. So it was still relevant. It, it has one of those books that is held, holds up through time. And it got kids wanting to learn. It got them waking up. If they're, you know how high school kids enter a room. They're like half asleep. They're exhausted. They're tired. They're going through like hormones. They stayed up way too late doing whatever. They went to a party in grade 12. I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> There's a lot that goes on in high school. And they come to class like, <sighs> or not. Sometimes they're pumped. But it got them going. Um, so it gets kids wanting to learn. So from videos to PowerPoints or hands-on learning experiences, you want to change it up to encourage active learning in your classroom. And here are some ways to change up how you deliver your lessons. Okay, so here we go. One is to have access, if you have access to technology in your classroom, right? So if you have access to technology, you can create a web quest or you can have kids design a presentation that they will teach. Or you can have them make videos about an artist or art movements in small groups. Or you could put your instructions online and have them watch the demonstration there just to change things up. Okay, I did this sometimes. I mean, obviously I could totally model in the classroom and I always did, but sometimes I would play my own videos in the classroom. And let me tell you, okay, I don't also know the difference because I have above me this arm that comes down at my desk here. This is where I film all my lessons or my YouTube videos and the arm holds my camera. So it looks like exactly like a document camera in a classroom. And I don't know what the difference is because what is, when they're looking at the screen, it looks the exact same as my hands doing things under a camera or me having a video. But let me tell you, they were so engaged with my videos, sometimes more than me. If just switching it up, just like it was different for them, right? So they just, it just changed it. And all of a sudden it was like so fascinating. And I'm like, oh my goodness, I don't get it. But it was just because it changed it up, right? Um, or if you even want to change it up again, you can pre-record yourself and your lesson. Then you can have them go find it online, um, your video. Um, and then they can watch it there, right? They just scan a QR code. It takes them to a blog post page or a YouTube, you know, private YouTube link, uh, whatever it is. And then they watch the demonstration there and pull along with it on their own pace. Maybe you have like an iPad per group. Um, and then it's just a way to change it up. And then meanwhile, you're going around and helping them all while you're also teaching sort of you can go back and forth play, replay, pause. Anyways, it's just a way to change things up and access your different learners. That is it. It's just trying something different to access your learners. And I like to experiment with these things, especially when you're coming close to like a holiday or a season. Like if, if you're coming up, I think, um, like for instance, like here in Canada or Thanksgiving is just like a one day thing. It's not like a huge big deal. But like, I know in, you get, a, I think a significantly longer break in the United States. And it seems like it's like 
a much bigger deal. But um, yeah, so if you're coming up to Thanksgiving or Christmas break and the kids get antsy, like this is when you're going to pull out those cool web quests or maybe have uh, one of your lessons demoed and video recorded and you pull that out, they're going to be when they're struggling to engage, right? Because they're thinking about break and so are you. <laughs> they're going to re-engage in a different way, right? When Or if you're exhausted and you're in one of those slumps, pull the, pull out this, right? And it's going to get everybody re-energized a little bit and re-excited. And that's when you can try experimenting and see what happens. If it doesn't work, well, didn't you learn from that, right? That's what I mean. Like you feel free to experiment. If it didn't work out, okay, no problem. But no big deal. You learned a lot from it, didn't you? So next is on task learning. <clears throat> okay. I spend the first two to three months, and I'm not joking, two to three months is what it takes to hone in on your expectations and classroom routines. It is not a first day or first week thing. You say it to them and that's it. You move on. You, the no, no way. Back to your school routines are developed at least over two weeks, if not longer, depending on how long you're going to see those kids, right? If you only see them once a week for 25 minutes, this is going to be a very lengthy process. If you see them every day, this is still going to be a lengthy process. You're, to set yourself up for a success, you need to practice these, even if it's small. You're not, over, not every day are you saying, these are the routines, blah, 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 blah. But you're going to making sure that you follow through with meeting expectations or if they do, if they all of a sudden go to go land at the door and everybody rushes to that door like runs there and or leaves things in the sink then you need to reinforce that expectation and have them go back and practice doing it again and be very firm on that like you are your firmest at that time of year but also flexible and cool and chill because you need to also win them <laughs> it is a balance right you're going to be working it and getting them to buy into your you as a teacher, but also you're going to be firm. <laughs> that is back to school. <laughs> and one of the things that you'll teach and model is what it, what on task learning looks like in, in your classroom. For me, I would actually physically pretend I was a kid. I would pretend I would model everything. I would go to a desk and I would show and demonstrate what learning looks like and what learning doesn't look like. <laughs> Okay, I would do it for laughs. I do everything for silliness. Um, but I would be for real having demonstrations. And for me, on for an okay on task learning in your classroom will look very different from someone else's classroom. But you have to do what you feel good with, right? If if it bothers you that kids are very loud, then you need to talk about what on task learning looks like in your classroom. And for me, this is what I'm, mine looked like. So on task learning for me meant that kids were actively making progress throughout work periods, right? And in general, I would often turn on like spa or Zen music or animal live cams. I love animal live cams. If you go to, and I would write this down, explore.org, you can find live stream animal um, cams. Can you guys hear me? Sorry, somebody said I can hear nothing. Okay. You let me know if you can still hear me. But anyways, um, I'm going to continue, hoping that you guys can. But, um, okay, good. Thank you. Um, sorry. Um, yeah, you can find animal live cams at explore.org. They have, like, the live um, eagle cameras. They have aquarium ones, manatees, uh, the safari kitty cat cameras like in like rescues okay you can put that on and often i would just hit mute on the volume because it's just like fuzziness anyways but just having that on there just watching fish or cats just kept the mood so calm it's like they related to that and that they didn't want to disturb the animals i don't know but they were just like so amazed right just so amazed and you can even put the music on on a different web browser from YouTube, find like a six hour Zen music playlist and just put that on. And that would keep them um, so focused. 
there's also uh these one playlist on youtube that's like the world's playlist where like they create ambient worlds um that's what it is ambient worlds if you look that up on youtube and there's like harry potter wizarding ambient worlds where like it feels like you're in the gryffindor common room with some music and things move once in a while it's not distracting it's just once in a while very rarely things like move or like a candle floats whatever so cool okay that keeps the vibes chill okay so, and I would often have it on during work time, just keep the, the mood down, um, but also they could talk if they wanted to. I was okay with that. And I would typically allow talking as long as it was within volume reason and allow, I also allowed flexible seating in my classroom. I never had a seating plan, but that was my teaching style. But you might not be comfortable with that. And although there were times that due to unexpected behavior, um, I wouldn't allow that, but, <laughs> or I wouldn't allow it for some individuals because they, they lost the privilege of having choice seating. Um, and it happens, it happens. Uh, but they can always earn it back if, you know, that's a, always an option. They just gotta show that they can handle it. But take the time to practice and repeat what on-task learning looks like. Literally write um, in on the boards and talk about it through every lesson, right? At the beginning of the year, you're going to have a lesson, and then you're going to talk about it before you let them go to work time. In that first back-to-school period, you're going to talk about, all right, we're going to go work. Can we talk? We're going to talk about what, again, remind ourselves what on-task learning looks like. When you're on task, you are working the whole time. I see your pen, you're, you're making progress on your artwork. Your hand is con continually busy, or it looks like you're thinking about your artwork. You're not just paying attention to the friends at your table. And you will repeat this or model it or have kids do a think pair share about what on task learning looks like, or you can have them say share, you know, all right, can anybody remind me what on task learning looks like? What are the, the five things I'm looking for in on task learning? And you do this every single class for the next month or two, um, depending on how long you see the kids, right? How often you see them. So, and also you need to reinforce that. So if you let them go and they're into work period and they're independently working now, right? And you're floating around and happening, I mean, and helping, and suddenly it gets a little bit too loud or you notice that there's not enough kids working, right? The kids are starting to get distracted and they're now talking. They've stopped working. Their hands are not busy. They're not focusing on their art project when they're having also their conversations. Um, and then you're going to say, stop and listen. And you're going to wait till they stop. Pencils down, eyes on you. Stop moving in the room. If somebody's not listening or they're, they didn't even hear you and they're still like working because they're just in the zone, then you can quietly say this instead of calling kids out, because I don't believe in calling out on a kid in front of everybody. So I would say, if you notice that someone at your table forgot to stop and listen, can you please give them a kind reminder to stop what they're doing and look at the teacher and you get the other kids to help you with that so you're not calling out anybody. Oh yeah, and then remind them of the expectation. Remember, we are doing on-task learning. On-task learning looks like blah, blah, and blah. Then we're gonna we're gonna practice again, and then if they do a whole period of on task learning, this is when you reward kids. I never gave you know actual physical rewards that often during the year, but boy did I reinforce that at the very beginning. It was it's like when you're training a puppy with those puppy treats, and you're reinforcing the when they do the, the trick or whatever it is at your command, and you reinforce them with those small little tiny treats, then that's what you do too. <laughs> Back to school. Reinforce with something tiny, like a sticker, a very tiny candy. If it's kindergarten, a Skittle. They, I did Skittles all the time. You get one Skittle, <gasps> you get two Skittles today. <laughs> get the bulk size at Costco. <laughs> and at this start of the year, um, after that's expected, okay, whatever it is. So small group instruction is another idea. I loved small group instruction. It's a way to support all your learners. And I eventually ditched my desk for a rainbow table so I could support all the kids who needed help. 
So kids would go to Party Island because that's what they decided my desk was named. Um, and again, I let them name it. I let them add decorations to it because I wanted them to come get help. And also, it meant that I was not moving my body around the room like a crazy person, trying to help one kid at a time, right? I know you know what that feeling feels like, right? I, I, I was not a believer in kids running around finding me to get help. I made that clear at the beginning of the year, right? Because you need to explain to kids how they should ask for help. You need to set that up as part of your procedures. How they should ask for help in a classroom. Are they going to come find you? Are they going to yell your name over and over again until you show up? Are they going to put up their hand? Are they going to become a trailer behind you? Are, are you? are they going to get up and go to the rainbow table if they need help? If there's a spot and sit there and you will all, you'll be there, right? You'll pop over there. So, uh, and then you can help like five to seven kids at a time and you can just chill. And when they're done, they can go back to their spot. Um, so, but you got to think about that. And I didn't want kids to be nervous coming to my table. I wanted them to come to me and get help. I wanted them to have a connection, right? And I wanted those kids who don't necessarily trust authority or teachers, the, the ones that have things going on in their own world, and it's hard for them to connect. Um, and they're usually the ones who maybe show unexpected behavior. I don't. I want those kids to come to me too, because when they're successful, they're going to want to be in my classroom and want to get engaged as well. Those are the ones that you guys spend that extra time and treat them like a little puppy, okay? That is it. You, you can see those kids right away. That's part of your back to school assessment when you're watching them during community builders or those like exploration activities. You're watching to see who engages or not or who might show an unexpected behavior uh, kind of kid. And those are the ones that you treat like a little puppy and you become their best friend. You become their best friend because it's going to help you down the road because you got that connection already. OK, and sometimes connection building takes months. I have had that too. <laughs> So many stories, guys. I got so much. I had a kid who screamed literally for the first three months in one of my classes. I'm bored. I'm bored. I'm bored on yelling level the whole class until I learned that he liked to make pizza and pies. And then I asked him about that and we would talk about it. And because he's like so excited that I was interested in his pie and pizza making skills that he stopped yelling that finally and stopped destroying my classroom. And that was, all, it took three months to discover that um, and a high amount of stress. And once I discovered that, game changer. But it takes that time, sometimes a long time. Ugh, let me tell you, it's stressful when you have those things happen because you have the rest of the class in there. So it's not just like, oh, I can't, it's not just, it's not at you. It's like, it's disturbing all those other kids who are trying to learn. And that is where the stress develops. So anyways, <clears throat> make, you want them to come to you. You want them to connect. So let them come up with a cool name for your party island. Or if you don't have a rainbow table, designate a helping table in your classroom or helping area where the kids will go to it if they need help. And when they go there, you know that that's where you will meet them. And that way you can help multiple kids at a time instead of running around the classroom and getting exhausted all day long. Anyways, moving on. So um, total participation techniques, get the book. Use it, research it. I can't suggest that enough. That's another suggestion. Five is engagement strategies. So research them, try them out, and see what sticks for you or your students, right? This is essential. You're going to have to do some experimentation and reflect on trying it. So, so intentionally think, I'm going to try this engagement strategy today. You're going to teach it. And then at the end of the day, before you leave, write down a note, a post-it note, if it worked or not. Okay, and that's going to inform you. And like, what grade was it? What age group was that that, that you tried that in engagement strategy? Did it work? What worked well? What didn't work? And that's going to inform you for your future lesson planning and how to get kids to engage with your lessons. But you're going to have to experiment. It has to take some trial and error. Okay, six is high expectations. Definitely hold the expectation, expectations in your classroom high, but allow for mistakes and experimentation, right? We have to have a balance. So if a kid wants to go above and beyond, and I usually extend their time for creating, if, it, and if, it's, if it's in reason, right? Um, or I can see they're still going to be able to catch up in the next project, whatever it is. If it's in reason, I extend their time for creating, or they have to figure out a way to make up that time. If a kid wants to take a risk to make it better, but fails at it, 
and the pro project flops, that should be okay still, okay? Because I've been observing them through the whole process of creating it. I know what it looked like until that flop. <laughs> um, and I'm gonna still grade fairly on their process, their attitude and willingness to take a risk. And isn't that what making art looks like? For I, as a professional artist, had two sculptures get destroyed in one art show. Artists flop all the time thinking there's, there are jobs that are literally art critics criticizing professional artists saying that they made a mistake, that blah, 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 blah. Artists take risks and make mistakes. So that is being an artist. That is what being a professional artist is. And we need to allow for that. So if a kid spends a ton of time researching this, that concept, that, and experimenting, and that to me is a solid win because they still learned an incredible amount from it. And they did show that they, at some point that they understood the standards and they met the curricular content. And that's all that it, for schools, that's what they're looking for. Did they meet it? Yeah, they did until it flopped, right? But that's okay. They still met it. They still learned it. They learned a lot more probably than most of the kids. But if they went that extending level, that exceeding expectations, and it just didn't work out at the end, that's okay. Value that because they took that risk. And not many people in this world are willing to take that risk. And you're not going to get big rewards without taking that risk. It might have worked out really well, but sometimes it's not, it's not always going to. And next is to teach kids how artists make mistakes. If you're having a lot of kids doing the give up thing, shredding the paper, um, needing a new piece of paper all the time, um, one is to teach growth mindset as part of your back to school routine and what that would look like in an art classroom. Lots of resources out there for that. I have lots of blog posts on teaching growth mindset in an art classroom. I have resources in my TPT store and even part of the Artastic Collective Art Curriculum if you're a member of it, which opens on August 1st for enrollment. Um, but I will teach all in depth on growth mindset for there. But I also have some resources that are very specific to art classrooms in my TPT store. But teach, no matter what, Find a way to teach growth mindset to your kids specifically in an art classroom and live it, own it, breathe it, model it. Every time you make a mistake or something's challenging, model how you're going to navigate it, but also share what you're saying as you're thinking, right? Like, oh, I noticed I made a mistake and you're going to say you're thinking. So that way you're making your, vis your thinking visible to your kids. So that way they know what to do next time they make a mistake. And you're going to do it every time because it might not stick to them the first time, but some point it will. And teach kids how, again, to mi fix mistakes. I teach it. I model it because I will at some point. I'm going to mess up during a demonstration. It's inevitable. It's inevitable. You're doing it all kinds of times. And then, or you could intentionally. I've also intentionally made mistakes as part of lessons when, as part of my back to school, I intentionally mess up so that I can model and revisit how artists make, pardon me, how artists make mistakes. So this is going to avoid all that paper ripping, the I need a new piece of paper situation. Again, I was not a big person on giving new pieces of paper unless you could see it in the kid's eyes that it was going to be a life and death situation or trigger World War III or trigger unexpected behavior, then it's a new piece of paper. There you go. <laughs> no problem. <laughs> it's not a problem, right? <laughs> not worth it over a piece of paper. Um, and I, and I, or you could see the tears. <laughs> not worth it, piece of paper. Um, again, read the, read the room. <laughs> um, uh, yeah, so yeah, I would definitely say teach kids to make mistakes. And my advice is this, and I would write this down. Um, but one, artists make, fix mistakes in that they take a deep breath. Okay, and I would model this whole thing. If you wanna write this down, let's say it again. First, artists make mistakes in this way. One, they take a deep breath. Two, they say, mistakes are okay, they help me learn. Three, they spend time looking at it and decide on how they're going to blend it in or turn it into something into their artwork. Four, 
they make the mistake, become a part of the artwork. Um, because artists, even the professional artists, make mistakes. And sometimes these mistakes inspire new creations. So we learn from it and we work it in. And five, we learn from our mistakes as artists. And we think about what that mistake taught us. Did we discover something amazing from making this mistake? Um, is there any discovery that's going to lead towards informing a future artwork? And that's how artists deal with mistakes. They take a deep breath. Mistakes are okay. They help you learn. They observe their artwork and think about how they're going to fix it. And then they fix it. That's it. And you're going to say that every time you make a mistake. All right. Next is to plan ahead. So finally, it is essential to plan ahead. The best way to feel stressed out and confused about what to do next or where to go or being defeated is by doing no planning. So many times have I been in schools and it's the first day of school, end of first day and the teacher's like, I don't know what I'm doing. I'm like, what do you mean you don't know what you're doing? <laughs> what have you been doing this whole time? <laughs> You knew, unless you were hired last minute, okay, that happens also, then forgiveness. All right, number one, take time at the start of the year to develop your first week plan and then keep it year after year, your first day, um, and take time to develop that year-long plan. And you're going to want to write the standards that you want to cover each month for each grade. Then you're going to pair an art lesson that you'd like to do and that will cover multiple standards or curricular content targets. And it's not one lesson equals one standard. No way. No way. No way. You're going to cover as much as you can in the curriculum in one go, right? And a lesson might be developed over a few le lessons, over a few periods, right? Might be time building concept and having kids talk about it or looking at professional artwork, right? Or artwork from art histories that that's going to then relate to what they're going to make, right? And you're going to do that viewing, art viewing part of the curriculum where they're going to ask questions about the artwork and things that they notice and then blah, 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 blah. And then you're going to go into teaching the techniques and processes. And then they're going to do the creating. And then you can even do another class where they're responding to it or reflecting about their own artwork or asking reflective questions or doing a critique or blah, 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 blah. But you're going to cover as much as you can in the curriculum if, with every project. So you're going to go deep into your units. That's the whole point of a unit plan, right? It's a whole bunch of lessons that make up going deep into a concept over a period of time the sequential lessons that create that and you're going to plan less by teaching more and making it more in depth adding like cool immersive experiences or whatever there's lots of ways to engage and teach different learners add a movement into your lessons in some way maybe kids get up and move to different spots they first start up they start under their desks, brainstorming under their tables. Then they're up on their desks to create. I'm just changing it up to engage them, to get their, their movement in. Maybe they're going to stand up and do something like expressive movement. Like they're going to paint with their arms in the air first to get their eye brainstorm out. And then they're going to do it on the, on the paper, whatever it is. You're just going to think about ways to get them thinking. But also remember, when you're planning your lessons, you got to go through the curriculum and highlight and color code everything you're going to plan. And then I would print those off and stick them on your lesson plan or the back of the example, because when you get to report cards, you know it's done. Check them off as you go. Have them printed for every day. Check it off as you go. And, and make note of what lesson covered them. And, and that way, you, when you get to report cards or whatever, assessment, when somebody's asking you what is being covered, you can say that. Or if you want to get make it visible, because sometimes you have, might have an administrator that just shows up in your classroom and wants to know how you're covering the curriculum with this lesson, you can write for every, have a whiteboard or have something that's in your classroom or part of your whiteboard and have what each grade is doing and the curricular content written down underneath it on a part of your whiteboard. You can turn part of it into a grid, right? Grade one is doing this. These are the standards that are being met with this project. So that way when, and it's not for you, it's not for the kids, really. It's for the parents and anybody who is needing to know that for whatever reason, at the, like all the time. And that way when they walk in, they're like, look at this teacher, 
has it all, right? They're all organized, they're covering the curriculum, blah, 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 blah. Um, if you have, or if you're in one of those instances, or you think you might be this year. Um, but that's a way to make it visible for everybody. But then also, it's visible to your kids. This is what we're learning. So when they go home, you can say, we're learning about the element of art line, we're learning about techniques and blah, blah, blah. And, they, and you can tell them, you can even read it off. And I've done that too. Whereas this is what we're learning. When, what are we gonna be learning with this lesson? This is exactly what we're learning. Um, and then say it in a kid-friendly way, because it's not written kid-friendly. Okay, so then next you're gonna create your art lesson plans in batches. You're gonna do this to save time. You're gonna create seven examples at once. Then write seven ways to hook their kids at the beginning of the lesson. You're gonna, are they going to walk in on an immersive experience where you're projecting something, uh, an artwork into the room? It's really big with some music going on. So it's immersive, like a immersive Van Gogh kind of experience, right? Like make it an immersive experience. Um, and or what? What are you going to do to hook the kids? Are you going to start off with some sort of video? Um, are they going to do some sort of four corner engagement strategy where they go to different corners to answer questions like a yes or no, but that corner is yes, that corner is no, that corner is whatever answer. They have to move around, whatever it is. Are they going to do a mini, mini 10 minute exploration doodle to hook them? Whatever it is, seven hooks, seven strategies you're going to do. Then you're going to write seven lesson plans and make all the additional materials and design seven strong conclusions for your lesson. Often teachers forget that you got to conclude your lesson. It's not just, oh, we made our project, move on. Okay, how are you concluding it? Is there a reflection? Is there a journal? Is there a peer-to-peer -peer feedback assessment? Is there a student self-assessment or whatever? Whatever it is, they need to have a conclusion to that, like reviewing what they learned. Okay, guys, so what did we learn through this project? Maybe it's a whole classroom discussion of what you learned, but you have to conclude it. And you have to have seven forms of assessment, right? Because you did seven projects. But do it in batches, right? Because if you're making an assessment, it's easy to make seven different ones, or it's easy to come up with seven different hooks. If you have a lesson plan template, it's easy to make seven lesson plans real quick. And if you're already making an artwork and you already are set up, you might as well make seven different examples instead of resetting up and cleaning up seven different times. And it's not going to be in one day. It's going to be over a, maybe a week. <clears throat> And then go photocopy it and copy ahead. And that way you're always one step ahead and there's never going to be stress or rushing. This is something that you have control over. You don't have control over what's going to happen during the day. You have absolutely no control over that. You can have a class that shows up having just ate a bunch of cupcakes. Or maybe the fire alarm and there was a fire drill or somebody pulled a fire alarm during the day at some point and now they're at your class. Okay, you have. they're going to be all kinds of sorts after that. And you have no control over that, but you do have control over this. So plan ahead and get one step ahead to, so that way there's never stress or rushing. You will always be ready. You don't, won't have to be going to a Facebook group saying, emergency, I have no lesson plan for kindergarten tomorrow. Give me yours. Like, no, you won't have to do that because you're ready. <laughs> and then if you do it once, you're done forever, right? If you make these well, and it's well done, put it into those clear page protectors and you're done forever. That is it. You're done. Do it once well and have it done. But don't be feel, feel afraid. Um, don't be worried about putting like notes about what worked well and what didn't, right? Like you can always put a post note in there like, don't do that hook. It sucked. <laughs> Try this one or whatever, or give more time for blah, blah, and blah. Next is to organize and keep a, your lessons permanently. Put all your lessons into clear protective sheets. I do it, guys, I'm telling you, do it once. Just do it once. This is my advice. Do it once. Do it once well. Um, put your masters into clear protective sheets and file into binders or save your documents and file in an organized way on your computer, not just to your desktop. I've seen some crazy desktops on teacher computers. Like, it's just everything's saved to the desktop. Um craziness how do you find things and also if you drop your computer it's gone clouds, clouds, clouds. i guess i've been help, trying to get my mom into the cloud i'm trying to explain the cloud and i'm trying to explain this to your giant usb that is saved somewhere in some mountain <laughs> probably but you can access it on all your devices i'm working on it but yeah 
keep it organized. Grade one, grade two, grade three, month one, month two, month three, for painting, whatever, whatever. Unit one, unit two, unit three. That way it's always, you're done forever, right? You don't have to keep doing this year after year. And next is to find art lessons, art lines. So if you're struggling to get ideas or plans, find art lessons online if you help need help getting plans. So there are, it is a lot to plan all at once. So especially if you're at the beginning and you need to alleviate some pressure or just have some resources, I would find art lessons online. Um, if you want, you could browse over 800 art lessons and art resources in my Teachers Pay Teachers store. I am Ms. Artastic on TPT, so if you search Ms. Artastic on TeachersPayTeachers.com, you will find all my art resources there from art history to elements and principles, art, full art lessons with videos or not. Um, everything is there when you're done. I have a growth mindset unit in there. I have a back to school community building because back to school is community building, but you make it art themed, right? They should be exploring art while community building because time is short and you are art, right? We don't want to do the same find someone who as every other class did. The kids can be bored, bored. So make it an art themed one. Maybe they're making mini masterpieces and then they're talking with their groups, um, whatever. They're doing collaborative artwork. So that way they're encouraged to get to know each other and you're gonna pop in and join in, but they're working and learning about each other and you're building community through art making. There's so much art making that is integral in community building. So again, um, Ms. Artastic on Teachers Pay Teacher, but let me tell you a little secret is that Teachers Pay Teacher is having their site-wide sale in a couple days. Okay, so August 2nd and August 3rd, Teachers Pay Teachers is going to have their back-to-school site-wide sale 25% um, off using the code BTS. 22. Make sure you put that in at the checkout or you're not going to get it. Okay. Um, my entire store, every single bundle, every single resource is all going to be on sale August 2nd and August 3rd only. So you need to make sure you go there on those days to get the sale. Everything 25% off. Um, that's one thing. Another thing is that tomorrow, something big is happening, guys. Okay. Are you ready for this? but you can find a fully planned art curriculum to save you time. So this is a huge thing if you're looking to save time this year, or if you're looking to have a program that's going to teach you um, three phases or processes for planning your year. If you want to know about how to plan your first day and set that up, planning your whole first week in a very clear, meaningful way, planning the whole year to come, and how to use and plan your art lessons um, in terms of like how long to use do elements and principles, the pacing for everything, how to integrate all of them um, with using an art curriculum, how to go deep into classroom management and be a proactive classroom management style, how to be productive, how to do assessment, formative and summative, how to plan and prep your back to school, how to plan and prep your end of year, how to do a year A and a year B and grade group in order to save you time so that way you're planning half as much using a fully planned already ready to go art curriculum so if you need that needing those professional resources that are already curated to help you focus on teaching and to alleviate some of the stress right these things that are in our control because of course lots of planning takes time takes your evenings it takes your weekends the kids are in a whole different state now right a lot of the time i've been hearing biggest struggle is organizing an, an art or finding an art curriculum, organizing the year. Um, and if you're wanting those templates and wanting somebody to walk you through that, you can find my art curriculum. It's actually opening tonight at midnight. <sighs> okay, but it will be open starting August 1st. That's why. Tonight at midnight. Um, August 1st, my curriculum is Artastic Collective Art Curriculum. It opens tonight. The link is in this um, lesson somewhere on the page, but I'll post it as well. So you can find it afterwards, or if you Google Artastic Collective on Google, you'll find it. Or if you go to misartastic.com, you will find the link up at the top of my blog. But Artastic Collective Art Curriculum, you can subscribe to it. It is my art curriculum that's going to take care of your planning. It opens tomorrow, yes, or tonight at midnight. But it will be open for enrollment for a limited time. So you only have until August 28th to join, um, to get on in the new program, because it starts off 
at back to school. And I have completely revamped my art teacher, exclusive art teacher program in there. It's the growth program. And you're going to go through three phases where I'm going to help you. Not only am I going to give you all my art lessons <laughs> in there, right? You're going to get all my resources. You're going to get a full art curriculum that's given to you over a two year period because that's how many there are. It's ridiculous. Um, but I'm going to help you start to finish your entire year, all the planning, all the planning, <laughs> full year of instruction. I'm going to walk you through that first day. I'm going to walk you through planning your first week. You're back to school. I'm going to walk you through your class management and proactive class management strategies. Again, I'm going to be walking you through planning your whole year. But not only that, I'm going to give you all the lesson plans and all my templates, my year long plan templates, all my reflective teaching templates, everything. I'm going to whatever I talk about in the lessons, I will give you the resources for that. So if I'm giving a, a growth mindset lesson and it's a work at your own pace course, by the way. So the students that enroll, the ones that are most successful and receive the biggest transformation, the quickest, are the ones that work through it quickly because it's, at, it's all available so you can work at your own pace and go as quickly as you need to. But the biggest results from going are from moving through it quickly. And again, open tomorrow. But you're going to get whatever I talk about. So again, if it's that growth mindset and I'm saying you need to have our class from growth mindsets, I talk about how to implement growth mindset and what it is. I will give you the art lessons and the resources for that. If it's about community building, because I'll go deep into community building inside the program that's included with the curriculum, right? I will talk about what community building is and I will give you all the resources and how to implement them in your art classroom that are specific for an art classroom. So you're not, it's not just make up. I'm not just telling you how to do it. I'm going to give you the lessons for it as well. And that's the benefit. And I'm even going to show you how to integrate the art curriculum and plan it for the whole year. So that is the Artastic Collective. It is opening tomorrow um, until August 28th. So, oh, and by the way, if you haven't registered for Artastic August, that also starts tomorrow. It's my free webinar um, that is, and I'll post that into this event page at, right as soon as this is done in a couple seconds here. But Artastic August, you can probably Google it, Artastic August. Um, it's my free pro D that I'm going to do for the month. I'm going to teach nine different art lessons and also email you a bunch of free resources. It's completely free. So I highly suggest that you register for Artastic August because I'm going to teach you how to do both, teach you some back to school art projects for free and elements of art projects for free. That's the theme this year, back to school and elements of art. So if you want some free art lessons, I'm going to fully demo them. And you can watch it at your own time. They're not live. So I, cause I know people are working in August. Most people, unless you go to school back to school in September, which is the case where I am. Um, but if you go back to school in August, I recognize you're working. So they're all, uh, pre-recorded and you'll get the video link and you have the whole month to watch them and then use those to create your own examples and teach in your classroom. Okay. But they're going to be five new ideas or no, sorry, nine new ideas for back to school and elements of art. Artastic August, and you. The, today's the last day to register. <laughs> today's the last day to register and enroll. It's free. So worst case scenario is you just don't open the emails. Um, and, but if you don't register, then you're going to lose access to nine free art lessons, let me tell you. So those are my five tips and advice and resources for first year art teachers. My biggest piece of advice is to just remember that this is your first year. A mentor teacher once told me that when I was new that it took around five years before I felt like I was in a groove. And I have to agree, after having gone through it, that is a correct statement. So don't worry about your first year or your second year, your third year. It is okay to still be learning. I am still learning. I am still learning. Education is ever evolving and ever changing. There's always something new to learn. So every year you're going to learn something new. Every class you provide will be, sorry, every class will provide you with a brand new experience to learn from, and you will have plenty of students who will throw you those curveballs. maybe sometimes literally. I've had that happen. It will be hard at times <laughs> and the middle, the middle will be messy. Remember, you're going to go up that super energetic back to school energy, and then it's going to have that slump. It's okay. Remember, there is that growth at the end where you're going to get out of it and you're going to be okay. And you're going to be a little bit hardened, a little bit stronger, 
<laughs> and you're going to take a lot more. Um, and it's okay to be afraid. And let me tell you, it's okay to say no at work. You're allowed to say no to, to think, to requests. If people are asking you to do things that are not part of your job, like, Pay, you know, you have your own things that you've got to make and they're wanting you to make some banner for their classroom. You can say no to that if you don't want to do it. If you really don't want to do it, you have no time, you're stressed out and burnt out. Don't rem remember, you're allowed to say no and then give them the kind suggestion that they have a projector that they could project a graphic on trace, okay? But it's okay to say no. Sometimes I think people take advantage, especially when you're new and when we're new, I used to say yes to literally everything, which is why I'm telling you to say, it's okay to say no, because I said yes to everything. I'd be there so late doing ridiculous things that then somebody, I would watch them crunch it up and put it in the recycling. I'm like, okay, I just spent, like, like after the after they were done using it, they just go in the recycling. And I, all I could think was like, I put my heart and soul into that because I wanted to impress you. <laughs> but so it's okay to say no. And remember, again, it's high at the beginning, messy in the middle, and then you'll come out of it so strong at the end. And it's okay to be afraid. It's okay to not know what you're doing or know that, know what you're doing every day. Um, but knowing what you do every day and knowing what you're going to do in the weeks and months ahead and year, getting planned is an opportunity for you to be a little bit in control of what's going on. And remember over the year, during the days and during the weeks and months, you're gonna hone and refine and perfect and calibrate your skills, right? You have these next years to calibrate and hone in and refine your skills and do things that actually work for you, right? You could try what I've said, and if something doesn't work, try something different, right? Until you find the things that work for you. Aim for progress over perfection, and you will do fine. That is it. And that's what we have to get aim for our students too, right? We want them to have progress over perfection. And those small incremental steps lead to massive amounts of growth in our future. And that is it for my friend. I hope you grabbed some information from this that was relevant. If you have any questions, um, you can pop that into the um, comments at this time. And if not, I'm also going to type in the link to Artastic August because I think that's the best thing if you're looking for some really great back to school art lessons. I will just email them to you with Artastic August. Oh, this computer is so slow when I'm live streaming. <laughs> it's been a day. Do you ever find that sometimes your computers do not work when you want them to the way that you want them to? Okay, here's our Tastic August. First link in the comments. It's free to register. Okay, and remember, teachers paid. Oh, what is it? Jennifer says, thank you for that. I, this is my second year of teaching. Um, and I'm feeling like I know less than I did the first. Jennifer, yeah, it's. It's amazing because you realize how much, the reason that is, is because you realize when you get into your second year, how much you didn't know. I, because I feel like they really, in teacher programs, they like build your confidence where your head is like, and you're like, I got this. And then reality hits you in the face in that very first year. And that's what I mean, like that, you're going into it like this and you just, you hit it low in your first year. It is normal. It's normal. And then in your second year going into it, you do. You recognize how much you didn't know. How much you didn't know. And like, I think the most learning happens from actually being a teacher. There's nothing that is comparable. So yeah, your second year is definitely, yeah, rose-colored glasses of first year teaching for sure gets removed. It's gone. It is absolutely gone. I get it. And it, it will be like that. Um, again, year five is when you're going to feel that groove. But even this year, think about how much more you know than last year and how much you've probably changed. And like I said, you get a little bit, when those unexpected things in the classroom happen, like it, it hardens you, it hardens you a little bit. Like you can see, like you look at a veteran teacher or somebody who's super experienced and you're like, man, 
they're, they're so any nothing phases them. Yeah, because they're, they have many years of getting like hardened. <laughs> Those chairs that fly. Like I worked at a school where like more than half the class struggled to show expect to show expected behavior. Right. It was very concentrated. So what I would be going to pro D's at other schools where teachers are like, oh, that one kid in the school, that's blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, there's one kid, one. I have like 13 of them in my classroom that are, are ex- extreme behaviors, right? It was unre- unrelatable. I couldn't even, I could no longer relate. I had to do online, online uh, pro-, pro D because I'm like, I could, cannot, none of what you guys are saying is, is, is applicable. Or they'd be like, oh, you could just have the technology in your classroom for all your kids. Well, I worked at a low income school, so that wasn't available. <laughs> right. But rose colored glasses gone, absolutely gone. Um, and you, but you've learned probably so much from it, right? You're going to go into your second year and you're going to know like, okay, like I need to focus on back to school as building those routine routines and procedures. You know what you got to do, right? And Take control of the things that you can control because there's always going to be um, lesson. There's always going to be those kids that throw curveballs, and there's going to be things that happen in a year that it's un- unexpected. You have no control over it. So the best thing to do is control as much as you can. But even experienced teachers have extraordinary challenges, right? Teaching is a challenging job, and people who have never been teachers, like the public, when they give bad like comments about teachers or whatever. And I'm like, dude, you've never, or they're like, oh, you get summer break. Oh yeah. You have no, those people have no idea how necessary a break is when you're a teacher. They have no idea. It takes that long to even get yourself ready to go back and face it all again. And how drained you get. It's draining. Um, Veronica asks about the curriculum. If it's grade one to 10, I would say the most ideal grades for my curriculum is K to nine. Um, probably depends on your, your tens. Okay. It's going to depend on your tens, um, and what you're doing with them. If they are in the groove of planning their own art projects and doing acrylic paintings or like their oil painting or some, something like they're more, uh, doing choice based or portfolio levels, I would say no, because then they're maybe more on a streamlined portfolio thing. Um, but my, pro- my program is going to do K to nine solid because for me, when I was in high school, I started getting those older kids to move up into more self-directed stuff. That being said, if you're looking for somebody who does um, if you're looking for something for the tens and you're like, I need my tens to accelerate or go higher then for your tens on teachers pay teachers. Remember the sale is August 2nd and August 3rd, go to look between the lines. Um, she does high school, high school resources. So she pop, she has more like those exploratory portfolio AP art stuff that would be good for that. And that's why I say my, my projects only go to grade nine because when I was in te- a high school teacher, it, and again, it depends if you're still doing more project based stuff together and it's their intro level, then they, if they're good, if they're grade tens and they have no experience for art, I'm guessing my curriculum is still going to be good for them. <laughs> okay. If that makes sense. But if they are, if they have experience art and their upper level, I would say take advantage of the TPT sale and look at, look between the lines um, her name is Whitney Panetta who designs it. And she's a, uh, I would say grade 10 to 12 level of resources. She's, and they're like, Oh, so beautiful. She's amazing. Amazing, 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 amazing. So good. If you're in the high school level, I would recommend that, um, because that's her focus. And Tiffany Fox, Mrs. T Fox on TPT does high school as well. If you're looking for that. So that's kind of what I think would be my advice. But yeah. Oh yeah. I was going to give you links to the curriculum and my TPT store. I get so distracted guys. I'm almost there. <laughs> There's just so much to talk about, right? Okay. If you're looking to join the Artastic Collective and um, if you want more information, is going to come go live at midnight. I'm just finishing up, up after this guys, uh, but more information is going to go live and some sneak peek previews will go live um, when you go to join it as well. So starting tonight at midnight, you're going to find 
the sneak peeks, the pricing, all those jazz, but all the FAQs are already up there. So that is just posted. That's the Artastic Collective Art Curriculum, www.artasticcollectiveartcurriculum.com. Opens tomorrow for a month. Um, there is a page in there that you can download now that you can print off about it if you want to give information to your administrator in advance to get them to preview it so you can get them to buy it. There's two ways to join. There's monthly and there's yearly. Yearly is usually if you can get your school to pay for it. Yearly is easier for schools um, or there's monthly. It is uh, cancel anytime. You can cancel your own membership anytime. But remember, when you join, start at the classroom. That is a three phase proven process, the course that is going to teach you how to implement the curriculum, but also is going to teach you again, how to do your first day, how your first week, your back to school process, your classroom management, proactive strategies, it's going to go through growth mindset and SEL in an art classroom specifically. And then I'll give you the resources to implement growth mindset and classroom management. I'm going to, you're going to talk, teach about formative assessment and summative assessment. And then I will give you the resources for that. I will give you lesson planning templates into, in addition to all the ones that are already pre-made for all my lessons, but in case you want flexibility, all those things are going to be included. And the students who achieve the best results work the quickest through the program. And it will, it will show you how to use the curriculum and implement it into a year. And you're going to honestly do a huge transformation. And I'm going to have you grade group and do a year A and a year B year. So that way you're planned forever. And you're gonna do half the amount of planning and half the amount of prepping. And that is the goal. Year A and year B rotation. And you can do this regardless, a year A, B, year B. K1, two, three, four, five, six, seven. And year A, year B, year, every year you rotate and you have two solid year long plans, but because you've grouped them, you're planning less, right? And you're prepping less in a day. If great K's and ones are gonna do the same thing. But remember, you have a year B, so they're not going to do the same thing next year. Oh, yeah. I will walk you through that. And I will give you the art resources and lessons and templates for all of it. That's the benefit of the membership over buying individual through my TPT store. But you can do either way. Oh, yeah, TPT store. Remember, the sale's coming tomorrow. You need the link for that. And that's tomorrow. The sale's starting August 2nd and August 3rd. August 2nd, August 3rd, guys, TPT statewide sale, last thing, and then I'm, I'm out of here to go work, <laughs> continue working. Um, and if you guys ever need more information, make sure you check out my blog. That's where I put all my pedagogical stuff. It's always on my blog and my podcast. All are called Ms. Artastic. Okay, here's my Teachers Pay Teachers store if you want to preload your cart for the TPT sale. So here's my TPT store, and I'll also give you my blog because if you want to dive deeper into some pedagogical stuff, that is where you're going to find it any time of the year. Okay, that's my TPT store, and I'll get you my blog real quick. And then, I, if there's no other questions, I guess I will say goodbye. But honestly, thank you so much for coming, and I truly appreciate that you guys all showed up. I really hope you found this valuable. And I hope that something of this sticks. Here is my blog. This is Ms. Artastic blog, where you're going to find pedagogical stuff and then also um, more strategies, more ideas, everything. Okay, there's a blog. Oh, I did it twice. That's cool. Oh, well, there we go. There we go. All right. I hope that was helpful. Um, and I hope to see you in the membership starting sometime, anytime soon, going to be an opening for enrollment tonight, midnight. Midnight, guys, I'm gonna be up late. <laughs> it's a long work day today. Oh yeah, look at that. Look, I got my living that art teacher life shirt on because one, I couldn't find my Ms. Artastic shirt. Maybe it's in my studio. I hope, hopefully I didn't accidentally turn it into a paint rake. Sorry, I have a, oh, which, which way? I'm working on things. It is in that stage of layer process that's developing still. <laughs> There's no eye. I had eyes, and then one day I eliminated the eyes. <laughs> and I'm gonna reach the eyes. I've done this. You know, sometimes you just like, or like you entered your studio with a glass of wine, and then things happen, and you change it. Isn't that funny? You wake up the next day, and then it's like, oh, I hope I'm okay with that. <laughs> I hope we're okay with what I just did back there. But yeah, you can see my sculptures up, up top.
Let me, oh, there's my film. I'll change it. This is my art side of my studio. There's more on this side too. I have quite, I'm in like the, my, my studio is lower than the rest of the house. Like my kitchen's probably starting up there. This is like kind just the grading of the house. So my ceilings are really tall. So I get to go up on ladders and carry giant sculptures high. Not safe. <laughs> Anyways, but that's my, uh, yeah, you can see I have my two different things going on in here. But this is where I, I live. And it's, it's on the shade side of the house, let me tell you. So I live in Canada, so it gets cold up in here because it's like at the, it's right in by my garage. And basically, it's an extension of the garage. It's cold. But right now, it's summer, so we're good. We're good. It's finally, it's finally, it's not raining. That's my life. Anyways, thank you so much for coming. That's it. There's no other questions, but I hope to see you in the collective starting ASAP. Um, going opening for enrollment tonight. Um, or if you don't want a full curriculum, you just want some different programs or different resources to check out. Teachers Pay Teachers Store Ms. Artastic. And that's going to be on sale August 2nd and August 3rd. 25% off everything, including the bundles with the code BTS22. Don't forget to use it. And my friend, I will. Oh, greetings from Norway. Nice. Hey, I have Veronica. You've been, we've been emailing, I believe. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Love it. So good. Oh, yeah. The sale is, uh, okay, Melissa, the sale on Teachers Pay Teachers is the TPT Back to School Sitewide Sale. It is um, on August 2nd, August 2nd and August 3rd, and everybody's stores will be on sale. My store, I have put every single thing on sale every individual and bundle everything i do not i do not not put things on sale the reason is because i don't put things on sale at any other time in the year i never i only do tpt statewide sales so the only time you're going to get my stuff on sale is during the tpt sales and so for my store every single thing is going to be on sale individual and the packages and um the um, code will be BTS22 at the checkout, unless they've changed it and it's automatic now, but I feel like TPT forgets to do things like that. I don't know why. Now, some most all stores will be on for sale for sure, 5%, but I know like for instance, if you're looking for the high school one at Look Between the Lines or Mrs. T. Fox, I know they're, they're going to have thing, everything on sale as well. They do the same thing. We put everything on sale. So they'll also be 25% off if you're looking for like that grade 10 to 12 level. Because I, I have some of the things that I do that older level, like my sketchbook programs and stuff like that. But I don't, I, because grade 12 is more exploratory, that's why I say um, like they're more self-directed, right? It's just totally different. It's a totally different ball game, And that's, and my, my lessons are more specific. So yeah, that's kind of my reason why I reference people to them instead for that. And I think that's, I'm just trying to be fair <laughs> because I think it, I, and honest and transparent because that's, I need, I want you to succeed. That's the whole thing. Yeah. So yeah, uh, TPT sale again, Melissa, I hope that helps August 2nd, August 3rd for my store, everything. And for our Tastic Collective, enrollment opens August 1st until August 28th. And if you missed any of this live stream, I'm going to post it. If you're wondering, oh my gosh, I came in late. Don't worry, I will post it um, many places. One, I'm gonna post it to the Artastic group. Okay, I'm a, this is based on assuming that I can write down, I can save this. I'm hoping I can. <laughs> but I am going to, if I can, Assuming that I've never done a live stream before. I'm so, so behind, guys. All these young, young people, Gen Z's, live streaming life. I don't know. <laughs> I miss that whole thing. I have my friends, I'm all, I'm all these people that I'm friends with, they're like early 20s and I'm, they're talking about things. And I'm like, I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> That's how I feel all the time now. I'm like, I don't know what the heck. I don't know. I don't know. Anyways, um, and so I'm assuming that I can download this video. And then I'm going to post it to my YouTube channel. I'm going to post it to my blog. I'm going to post it to their Tastic group. I'm also going to post it into the membership. So if you become a member, you can rewatch it later on. Um, but I mean, I don't think you will want to as much because it's going to be more valuable to go through the classroom 
the year-long art teacher growth program that's included and exclusive to the curriculum only. So that's going to be so in depth. You're not going to have you're going to be focused. Let me tell you, you're going to focus. You're going to be racing to get through it because you're going to want to get through that transformation where you go learn phase one, second phase, um, apply, and then you're going to go through ascension in phase three. Okay. And you're going to become an art teacher boss. That's where I'm going to take you. And you're going to have a year A, year B plan. I'm going to get you there. And then you're going to have next summer vacation free. You're going to be done before the year ends. Because I have high expectations for you. You're going to do it. You think I'm crazy right now? I, I sure am, sort of. <laughs> but you're going to do it. You're going to love it. You're going to own it and live it. And remember, it's cancel any time. So if you get in, you're like, no. No. Go into your account settings and you can cancel there. <laughs> it's all good. <laughs> That's all good. I am a transparent person, guys. I do not, I do not believe in hiding things. Mm -mm. Too much. It's too much effort to be sketchy, I feel like. I don't get it. It's so much easier to <laughs> be an honest person in life. <laughs> it really is. Okay. Love you guys lots. Thank you so much. And I hope you have a fabulous day and a fabulous back to school if you're going back or are already back. Don't forget to sign up for Artastic August. See you later. This is Kathleen McGivern, Ms. Artastic, peacing out.